It's a real honor to be here tonight. Uh, and I want to just uh, carry on from the work Marissa was doing and highlighting some of the vignettes that she gave you. And, and I'd like you to take just one minute now. And I'm going to grant you in this minute the power to design your own death. You get to pick when, you get to pick where, you get to pick how long you have this knowledge for, you get to pick uh, what kind of treatment you'll have, you get to pick the symptoms, and you get to pick your place of death. So I'd like you to just close your eyes for 45 seconds and, and imagine that scene for me. very bold and suggested that no one in this room under the age of 60 picked a time before they turned 60 as the time at which they were going to die. And I'm going to suggest that uh, some of you may have wanted to die suddenly in your sleep. Is that, was that the wish of, okay. Um, some of you may have picked a, an illness that would keep you relatively symptom free for a short period, for a period of time. And during that period of time, you probably wanted to do your bucket list, right? The things you want to do before you die. And I would imagine that, that during that time, uh, when you're not skydiving or experiencing something new and exciting that you've always wanted to do, you were spending time with your family. And you were maybe uh, putting your affairs in order or saying your last goodbyes. Am I, am I close for most people? All right, so now I'm going to give you uh, four vignettes to think about. And uh, through thinking about these, I'm going to give you a little insight into the work that I do as a palliative care physician at the Hospital for Sick Children. Imagine now that you're a 16-year-old girl. You have a condition called cystic fibrosis. You were born with it. You've known about it since you were able to walk and talk. You knew what you had. You know that people with cystic fibrosis die, nowadays they die in their 30s and their 40s generally because medical care is much better than it was for this condition 15, 20 years ago. And you've grown knowing that. You've known that your life is going to be shortened. However, in the last couple of years, you have the misfortune of picking up a bacteria that is resistant to antibiotics. And since that time, your lung function has markedly decreased. And so now you're in a position where you know that the only thing that's going to save your life for now is a double lung transplant. And you've just been given the news last week that you're not going to be put on the transplant list. You're not deemed appropriate for, for transplant. So think of what must be going through that young girl's mind compared to all the things you wanted to do in the, the time I gave you with your magic wand to, to determine your own death. Now you're a 13-year-old girl, and you were diagnosed with a cancer called neuroblastoma stage 4, which is a horrible kind of cancer, when you were five. So pretty much your whole life, you've been going to the hospital, you've had chemotherapy, you've had surgery, you've had all sorts of treatments. And uh, you know that you have a bad cancer, but it seems that every time something goes wrong, the doctors come up with something, something they can try, that, that makes you feel better. You know your cancer hasn't gone away, but you feel better. And you go to school, and you do arts and crafts, and you have a horse, and you go horseback riding, and you do that pretty regularly. And now you've been in hospital most of the summer, because there's tumor in your belly and there's fluid in your belly. And you've not been able to do the things that you like to do. You didn't get to go to the cottage. You didn't get to ride your horse as often. And your doctors just sat down with you and your mom and told you that uh, after nine years, he's finally at the point where he doesn't have another drug. There isn't, not only can he not cure your cancer, there isn't anything he can give you now that's going
going to help you stay alive any longer. So think of that girl in light of all the tasks you put um, out for yourself. Now, uh, how many people in the room are parents? A great number of us. Okay. So you're now the, the parents of a four-year-old boy who uh, had a normal birth, was developing normally. He's the youngest of your three sons. And suddenly you notice that he's not as steady on his feet as he used to be. And he seems to he's wet in the bed. He hasn't been doing that for a long time. And he's taking a long time getting dressed and he gets his buttons mixed up. And just things that he could do two weeks ago, he now can't do. And then one day he has a seizure and you take him to the emergency room. There's a whole series of tests done and you're given the name of a very long disease that is a metabolic condition that has to do with his mitochondria, which are the sort of energy makers in every single cell that you have. And you're told that this is a fatal disease and that he will not make it to his teens. And over the next five years, you watch your son die bit by bit. He loses his ability to move. He loses his ability to orally, to verbally rather communicate. He loses his ability to eat and has to have a feeding tube put in. And now besides being his parent, you're his medical caregiver 24 hours a day. The final thing that I'll give you is you are a healthy woman who is uh, having her second pregnancy. And you and your husband are over the moon excited about this because you've learned in the first, uh, in the second ultrasound that this is a son. So the perfect complement to your five-year-old daughter, you're going to have a wonderful, perfect family. And the next ultrasound, the technician isn't quite so cheery as she's scanning your baby and she leaves the room and she comes back with someone else who looks. And before you know, you're off to see a specialist and you've learned that there's a problem with the, the unborn baby's heart. More tests are done and you learn that this baby has a chromosomal problem and that children with this particular chromosomal problem, 90% of them die before the first year of life. And with the heart problem, not even sure that your baby's going to make it through the pregnancy. You're given the option of terminating, but that's not the right option for you and your family. That's just not something that feels right for you. So your decision is to carry the baby to term. But you don't know what's going to happen at delivery. Is the baby going to be born alive and breathing? Will the baby need help? Um, the, there's a chance that surgery might be able to correct the heart defect, but there's great concern about the development of the brain. So there are all sorts of things that need to be done to your baby once the baby's born, should he survive. 